And this section will generalize our results for one particle uh, to the angular momentum of many particles. Imagine you have a large collection of particles. Each particle is labeled with a number alpha. The position of particle alpha is shown here uh, with the r vector. We can then calculate the angular momentum for the whole system by summing up the angular momentum for each individual particle alpha. That's shown on the top line. And then we can calculate the change in the system's angular momentum vector, L dot, as the sum over the change in each particle's angular momentum. And that, of course, is equal to the sum of R alpha vector crossed into the force vector on particle alpha, F vector alpha. As before, we can divide the net force on particle alpha into internal forces, so uh, forces between the particles in the system, and external forces, so forces from anywhere else in the universe on particle alpha. And so that gives us two terms for the time derivative of the system's angular momentum vector. There's going to be a sum over alpha of a sum over beta not equal to alpha of R alpha vector crossed into uh, the force vector representing the force of particle beta on alpha plus R alpha crossed into the force vector for all external forces applied to particle alpha. We can rewrite this first term representing torques uh, internal to the system uh, in this way. Here's that expression again, remember a sum over alpha, so alpha goes from uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to n, however many particles we have. And then there's a second sum, beta not equal to alpha. So for example, when alpha is equal to 1, uh, beta is never equal to 1 in that sum. So we take this sum and we can rewrite it uh, in this way so that we have a sum over alpha and a sum over beta greater than alpha. And we can see what's happened now is that we have two components to that uh, term in the sum. We have vector alpha, uh, we have vector r alpha crossed into the force vector for particle beta acting on alpha plus uh, r beta, so this is the vector location for particle beta, crossed into the force vector representing uh, particles alpha's forces on particle beta. And to see exactly how this sum works and why we can rewrite uh, this other sum in this way, uh, check out the notes that I've posted online along with this video. And so let's look at how we can write the sum of these two terms. So remember the, the term on the left, that's the torque resulting from particle beta's force on particle alpha. And then the term on the right, that's the torque resulting from uh, particle alpha's force on particle beta. Newton's third law tells us we have equal and opposite forces. And so the force of particle beta on alpha is equal and opposite to the force of alpha on beta. And so that means we can rewrite this expression and replace this force with minus this force. And that turns into this expression right here. So now we have uh, vector r alpha being uh, subtracted, uh, vector r beta, and all of that crossed into the force of particle beta on alpha. This little diagram down here shows uh, what the difference between uh, r alpha and r beta is. It's basically a vector that points from particle beta to particle alpha. Now if we imagine that all the internal forces of the system are central, which is to say that they all point from one particle to the other that, uh, on which the particle is acting, then of course we have a nice simplification here. So if the forces are central inside the body, which is very often the case, we get a nice simplification. Namely, that that cross product there is zero. And so the upshot of this is that the change in the system's angular momentum vector is just the change due to external forces, very similar to what we had uh, when we were looking at linear momentum and its conservation. And so we can write that sum of R alpha crossed into uh, the external forces vectors. That's just the external torques acting on the system. Now, one thing that's important to keep in mind is we can define the torque using any coordinate system we like. So for example, we can take a coordinate system over here and say here's all our particles in our system. Let's imagine that this particle has a momentum P alpha pointed like this. The position vector of that particle in this coordinate system is this vector right here. So it points from here to that vector. 
And when we cross that uh, r vector into that p vector, we get an angular momentum for that particle that looks like this, pointing out of the page. But we can choose any coordinate system we like uh, to measure torques relative to. We can, in fact, uh, move our coordinate system over to here, for example, to some other point. And now the position vector for particle alpha is this vector here. And we, when we take the cross product between this vector and that momentum vector, we actually find that the angular momentum measured in this coordinate system points into the page. So there's no problem with the fact that these two angular momentum vectors are not the same uh, because the dynamics of the system isn't going to care exactly where we put our coordinate system as long as it's uh, 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 an inertial coordinate system or, as we'll see in a second, uh, another kind of coordinate system. One very natural coordinate system to choose when looking at these angular momentum problems is the coordinate system attached to the center of mass of the system. And as it turns out, any changes in the total system the angular momentum up, as measured about the center of mass are equal to the external torques as measured about the center of mass. And as we'll find, it turns out that even if the center of mass itself uh, is an accelerated reference frame, so even if the whole body itself feels an acceleration uh, so that the center of mass is not an inertial frame, this equality still holds. We're not going to prove it here. Uh, but that means that this is a very powerful choice of coordinate systems.